All right, it is time to begin. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. My name is Katie Petroli. I work here at the Nashville Parthenon. Um, I'll be introducing our speaker in just a second. Before I do, I want to give a warm thanks to some of our sponsors who have made this morning's program possible, as well as an entire weekend of fun archaeological festivities possible. This talk is connected to our temporary exhibit called The Role of a Replica, which was sponsored by Humanities Tennessee, Centennial Park Conservancy, and Metro Nashville Parks and Recreation. It's an exhibit that is dedicated to sharing what we can learn from exact replicas of ancient artifacts, ancient building materials like a model crane, or even from a full-scale Parthenon itself. Another sponsor for this morning's talk is the Archaeological Institute of America Nashville Society. We want to thank the Archaeological Institute of America for their society outreach grant that made it possible to bring our speaker here all the way from Greece to Nashville for really a whirlwind weekend connecting with local middle schoolers. Shout out to IT Cresswell, who were phenomenal on Friday with really great questions and yesterday's International Archaeology Day at the Parthenon program, where I will admit Dr. Yulia Zonu talked to about 200 people over the course of the morning. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our expert archaeologist for today's symposium. Dr. Yulia Zonu is the Associate Director of Corinth Excavations, which is part of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens in Greece. In collaboration with a staff of 10, she curates the school's substantial collections of artifacts at the Museum of Ancient Corinth, which amount to over 190,000 physical objects and more than half a million digital records. She's an active researcher and teaches archaeology to everyone from kindergartners in the village of Ancient Corinth to doctoral candidates and postgraduate students who come through Corinth and really call Corinth home. She's a native of Siadisan, Western Macedonia, Macedonia, and she graduated from the University of Athens and her PhD is from the University of Cincinnati. She was a Schliemann and Spitzer Fellow at the American School and she has excavated periods ranging from the Neolithic to the modern in um, a wide variety of places, including uh, France, Athens, the Argolid, Macedonia, and Corinth, and most recently, Sicily in Italy as well. So, Dr. Yulia Donu, uh, I will ask you to unmute and take it away when you are ready. Thank you so much, Katie. This is a fantastic, fantastic experience for me. And really, ancient Greece was a vibrant and uh, colorful place. And I can share maybe also my screen uh, so that I can start um, the PowerPoint. Um, wait a minute. Um, let me know if it works. That looks perfect, Julia. Um, fantastic, fantastic. So I was starting to say that ancient Greece was a vibrant and colorful place. And I will talk today about one of its cities, Corinth, about its history and the excavations at the site conducted by archeologists of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens continuously since 1896. I will talk about stories of people of the past and stories of the people who revealed them. How do we get to learn about them both? And why is it important for us to know? As Katie mentioned, I am a Greek archeologist and the associate director. I work at ancient Corinth, Greece. And I am extremely grateful to Katie for this unique 
opportunity today. And actually, the last couple of days have, have been very exciting for me, being at the Parthenon in Nashville uh, to talk about Corinth. Athens is actually arch enemy. <laughs> Katie Petroli um, graciously invited me to present on my hometown, on my Patrida, Corinth, in this exciting setting, really, where America meets classical Greek cultural heritage. And I had the privilege yesterday to talk to a large number of people who came to the Parthenon and they really had a genuine interest in knowing exactly what we do in Corinth, what we do at the American School. Uh, not to mention the middle schoolers from Cresswell that I met on Friday. Um, and they were an extremely beautiful school of visual and performing arts, a fantastic, a phenomenal experience for me. I am really grateful. Uh, here you see Katie in action at the Corinth Museum during one of our programs. We were so happy to have her as our first Steinmetz Fellow. Uh, and we're grateful to have the support by the Steinmetz Family Foundation to be able to have a person dedicated to outreach in Corinth. I cannot stress how important this is for what we do. Katie and I strive to make the richness of the stories of the people of Corinth accessible to wider audiences. And I thank her for opening my world up to many new possibilities and for the fantastic work she did with the digital accessibility and availability of our archive. You see her here talking to New York students in one of her virtual field trips from Corinth that she instigated. I'm no stranger to the Midwest, even though I hear that Tennessee is the Mideast or the South. After I graduated from the University of Athens, I did my graduate studies at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. So I called Ohio home for a number of years. But over the last 20 years, I've been working in Corinth and I've been discussing the past and how it relates to us now and to our future with Greeks, with Americans, with people from all over the world, really, as they visit Corinth incessantly. And so, where is Corinth? And let's see if this is gonna work, because I would really like to share with you this interactive map that um, uh, James Herbst, architect and IT specialist of Corinth Excavation. Corinth Excavations has been putting together. This is a page where you can easily navigate and explore um, uh, fantastic uh, uh, maps, GIS data, and archaeological data combined. And you see, so this should be now um, available for everybody to see because I think it's really a great way to experience the complexity of the, of the, of the site in the landscape and also the complexity of um, the work that the American School um, has been doing. And I can zoom out if it's, if it's visible now, Katie? Yes, we can see your zoom out as well. Yeah, so this is great um, because it, it contains um, in on Google Earth, on the actual landscape, the, mar uh, the markers of all of the excavations uh, taking place, not just in the middle in the Roman Forum, which is right here, but all throughout the landscape, starting from um, Acrocorinth, the castle, to the, to the south, um, then the fortification walls of the actual city, and the long walls connecting us to the sea, and the sea here is uh, obviously the Corinthian Gulf to the north. I'm just zooming out. We can see the um, the isthmus here, the narrow uh, stretch of land connecting the Peloponnese to mainland Greece. Athens um, will be here and zooming out just to 
um, get a sense of how far Corinth is from Nashville, Tennessee, and the Parthenon, how far the Parthenon of Athens has traveled here. So now going back, so this is, this is a more static map showing the location of the site. Um, next, I would like to bring everybody's attention to a fantastic video we created on Corinth. The video showcases the video called The 12 Decades of Discovery, American School Excavations at Corinth, which you can find on our webpage um, on scsa.edu.gr. Um, is showcasing the work of many people that I represent when I talk about the site. It was produced by Nikos Dalyandas and his team, and we all contributed. In Corinth, we built on the shoulders of giants like Charles Williams and Nancy Bukidis, and you see Charles Williams in the background here, and Nancy uh, lower down always hiding away from the camera. Um, director and assistant director of Corinth Excavations from the 60s into the 2000s. Chris Pfaff, who is professor at Florida State University, is our director now as we create new knowledge and new generations of Corinthian researchers. Our academics, a number of them you see here from the 1970s, uh, Kathleen Slane is among this group, among others. Uh, but also our local ancient Corinthians, the people who have been by our side since 1896, when Americans started digging here, but uh, also the multitude of children, families, students, university students, researchers, other parties interested in the past tourists. We all form a polyglot, multi-ethnic community in Corinth, in which we all thrive. The American School of Classical Studies is a non-profit, privately funded institution, and it operates in Corinth thanks to permission by the Greek Ministry of Culture and Sports and its local representative, the Ephoria of Antiquities of the Corinthia. Our collaboration with our colleagues, the staff, and the director of the Ephoria, Panagiota Kasimi, is exceptional and we are grateful for that. Throughout time, Corinth's role was central in bridging the Mediterranean, this sublime sea that unites us all. And here you see Acro Corinth on the, on the back, on the background here, the site extends all through the plain and to the north here, you see the harbor. As Fernand Brodel wrote, this is a scene that patiently recreates for us scenes from the past, breathing new life into them. A sea that has to be seen and seen again. This sea was a defining feature for the life of the people in Corinth. In my talk today, I would like to focus on two aspects. First, the evidence we archaeologists collect with our workmen that help us in our reconstructions of life on the site for the last eight and a half millennia. The site's role in transportation and communication was central, and thus its control by major powers in the history of the Mediterranean, like the Romans, for example, was unavoidable. Second, is the organization of our huge physical uh, collections of artifacts. And now um, our extensive and very rich digital archive. The dissemination of the knowledge contained therein to visitors and the general public, in addition to archaeologists and academics, is one of our crucial efforts. So we start with the evidence. How do we know about Corinth's greatness? We possess literary and archaeological evidence. Some of the epithets assigned to Corinth by ancient writers 
describe the city as wealthy. You see here a selection of the city's coins, especially the one, um, the silver one uh, on the top here that has the emblem of the city, the flying Pegasus. The city was well watered, was most glorious. Acrocorinth was the star of Greece. The city had high towers and it was welcoming foreigners, even though not everybody could go to Corinth, according to Horace and Strabo. The city was on via, according to Pindar, or Pindar the great poet. So it was a happy place. And also it was the gates of the Peloponnese and the chains of Greece. The city's many innovations and its key role in history include among others, and I cannot be exhaustive here, just indicative. First, its role in shipbuilding and seafaring was central. The Corinthians were the first ones who built the trireme, the warship that you see here, on a crater, on a wine mixing bowl. And we know that the first shipbuilder, the Corinthian Aminocles, is the one who did the first trial. A key feature of the city's thalassocracy was the Diolkos, a stone paved road that you see here connecting the harbors of the city. And the effort of the antiquities of the Corinthia is currently engaged in a major program of cleaning and presenting this um, amazing engineering feat of the Corinthians for the public. It will be opening soon. So this stone paved road connected, connected the two uh, gulfs. You see here a view from the top of the mountain from Acrocorinth towards the narrow strip of land that connected the Peloponnese to mainland Greece. And so to the east is the Argosaroni Gulf, to the west is the Corinthian Gulf. The Vilkos spanned the area here, eight kilometers long, dragging the ships from one gulf to the other. And how this all worked, you see here a reconstruction by Yanis Nakas, one of the staff of the Legion Harbor project, a big project excavating underwater remains of the harbor of the city of Corinth. Um, and so the way this would have functioned, there would have been at one of the harbors, a stone paved platform on which the ships were pulled out of the sea. With cranes afterwards, they were put on an eight-wheel vehicle, which you see here, drag, dragged along with wheel ruts by oxen or slaves. The question we have today that we try to figure out is how often this would have been used. And would it only have been used rarely for military reasons or every day, for example, for commercial purposes? I believe that built at such an expense and such a human effort, this road must have been in constant use by the Corinthians. At the location of this ancient Viorgos, a canal was later cut through and you see it as it exists today. After many attempts in throughout history, the, the canal was finally accomplished by a French company in 1893. And how important for communications this canal was is shown by the fact that the Nazis bombarded and blocked the passage through the canal in the Second World War. And you see the battle that took place at the Isthmus at the time, and it was only possible to use it again after it was cleared, uh, after all the debris was cleared away by the US Army Corps of Engineers in 1948. Then to go back to our site, you see here in the foreground, Acrocorinth, the Great Castle. I would like to discuss briefly the history with a view 
to familiarize you with what I consider the universal value of Corinth to be for all people. The millennia of human presence have left traces in the landscape in a wide array of monuments, and excavations have been conducted from the castle of Akrokorin here down to the sea and the harbors. The city, the walls of the city, uh, 15 kilometers long, extend for a distance of five kilometers from the sea. And also we do have long walls here that connect the walled city to the harbor, thus protecting the harbor. We have a number of projects uh, here in addition to the Lechian Harbor project that I mentioned previously, uh, headed by Bjorn Loven, uh, we also have a project of a synergia between the local Euphoria and California State University at Long Beach. Paul Scotton and George Spiropoulos are in charge. The center of the city had religious, political, economic, and administrative functions um, throughout time. As you see here, all the monuments superimposed in this fantastic map uh, of, the, of the center. Today, the center is nestled within the modern village of ancient Corinth. You see here in the center, the Temple of Apollo, our major monument, the museum of ancient Corinth, where we work. The headquarters of the American School of Classical Studies are back here, and the village spreads um, in this direction, the village of ancient um, Corinth. This also is the part that forms the fenced archaeological site visited by tourists. A large habitation existed here already during the um, Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, and I show here a selection of pottery and terracotta figurines from those um, early millennia. We do have evidence for the Middle Bronze Age, um, and I just show as an example this gold diadem head, headband basically uh, from a Middle Bronze Age uh, grave, uh, it was used by a woman. And finally, the late Bronze Age, that is the time uh, that Homer uh, refers to, or Homer remembers in his poems in the Iliad, the time of Agamemnon's kingdom. Uh, I believe Corinth was extremely powerful at that time as well. And this is a book that I am uh, working on. Cyclopean walls existed on top of our mountain, on top of Acropolis. Moving on to the 8th and the 7th centuries um, BC, and this is now 2,800 years ago, if we want to think about it that way, Corinth sent out colonies to northern Greece, to modern Albania, and even to Sicily. And the most powerful among them is here, the city of Syracuse in Sicily that was built in 733 BC. So the prosperity of Corinth at the time is reflected in its colonies. And through its colonists and its traders, Corinth extended its cultural gifts and the city's many innovations over a huge area. Uh, for example, Corinth shared its expertise in architecture because the Corinthians had a lot of experience with constructions uh, and this resulted in them altering their landscape early on. I show here the central part of the site uh, with the two temples that existed in the center on what we call uh, a temple hill, uh, one built in the 7th century and one in the 6th century um, BC. These are temples to um, the god Apollo, the god of music and light. The earlier temple, and I show you here a reconstruction by Robin Rhodes, uh, was a building without columns, but it was monumental and rectangular. It had stone foundations and mud brick walls, complex roof tiles, and this was uh, an altogether new type of architecture. And this kind of architecture is introduced into Etruria in Italy around the middle of the 7th century, and this is because 
of the Corinthian Demaratus, who went to Etruria, and the architecture introduced by the Corinthians to Etruria supplanted earlier local small oval huts. The next temple built on site after the destruction of the previous, the sixth century temple that you see here on top in a reconstruction of a fifth century landscape by James Herbst replaces the earlier one. And the new building has similarities to the temple of Apollo in Syracuse. And in both cases, the columns are monolithic, that is single blocks in both temples. And both temples are among the earliest of the transition to structures that completely are built of stone. Rather than exporting architecture, the city was big in clay production and trade. Potters from Corinth experimented with the black figure technique and with the use of color in vase painting. And again, the Corinthian Demaratus brought to Italy in the middle of the seventh century potters with him. And according to the Roman historian Tacitus, he also brought literacy to them. So the main type of pot exported by the Corinthians, the Alabastra and the Ariboloi, uh, were widely, traveled widely in the Mediterranean, and we are investigating whether it was for the parts themselves as objects or for what they contained that these um, artifacts were so greatly desired abroad. Corinthian pottery was so popular that it was imitated as well. Its existence on site helps us date the strata. It is something that appears universally and develops in terms of shapes and decorations through time. Corinthian clay studies have been vibrant for decades and continue to be. The excavation of our potter's quarter, the place where the Corinthians, one of the places where the Corinthians were making their pottery, um, has th those excavations um, that took place um, almost a century ago now gave us a lot of wasters and a lot of trial pieces. So wasters are um, pots that collapsed in, in the firing. And also pieces like the one that you see here in the um, upper left corner, which is a drinking cup that has um, a lot of uh, different brush strokes for the painter uh, to experiment with different firing to see what the result uh, would have been. Uh, we have identified painters' hands who produced parts in the premises, and these parts traveled abroad and appear in faraway places. And I just show here, um, as an example, uh, a cotili, a waster from the potter's quarter by the silhouette group painter one, and a small fragment of the same painter that we excavated uh, in uh, Agrigento, Sicily. Another commodity that the Corinthians uh, were famous for in antiquity was Corinthian bronze, a well-known metal in the classical period, highly praised for its color by both Greek and Roman authors such as Pausanias, Pliny, and Cicero. A study is now underway to give us new evidence for its production and its color, as well as color perception in antiquity by Agnese Benzonelli at University College London. How active the Corinthians were in shipping materials around the Mediterranean is also testified in numerous shipwrecks uh, that show wide circulation of pottery. And um, an exceptional shipwreck, a Corinthian, is recently discovered in the Otranto Straits, the narrowest passage between uh, the shores of Greece and Albania uh, on the east and Italy on the west. This is a first half of the 7th century Corinthian uh, wreck that contained amphoras, hydriae, and uh, in Okoe, and you see here some examples from the wreck and the parallels from the museum in Corinth. So we have water and wine pouring vessels. Um, also, skifoi, drinking cups. Uh, you see them stacked here on the right. Uh, and they were contained here in a huge storage jar, um, a pithos. 
The amphoras also contained olive pits that you see here on the left. So we see that both the pottery was, was traded for itself, but also the produce that it contained. A total of 200 vases were among the wreck, and the plan is to recover all of them, according to a recent talk by Barbara Davide of the Underwater Ephoria uh, of Italy. Other than amphoras and olives, Corinth was big in the fish trade, and um, I show you here a few examples of salted fish fillets on the left. Uh, from uh, materials that were um, excavated on site, but originated all the way uh, from Spain in the 5th century BC. Uh, the amphora that contained the fish, um, and a number of these amphoras probably originated um, from Cadiz and Malaga in Spain, and the fish is from the Atlantic Ocean. And this is according to research done uh, by Antonio Saez Romero of the University of Seville. Fish was very important for the Corinthians. You see uh, uh, also a representation here um, on actually an Italian medieval pottery uh, of Maiolica that was again imported to the site. But the connections with Italy are strong throughout time. I just show here a couple of cantharoid drinking cups from um, Etruria from 6th century BC. Marble statues of the Kuros type from Paros were set up as grave monuments in the 6th century, another indication of the wealth of the city. And exactly Corinth's location means that the city served as an anthropos for goods and people moving by sea between the eastern and western Mediterranean. Thus, Corinth was very attractive to St. Paul, and I will jump us now in time to the first century AD. St. Paul visited the city three times. And Julius Caesar, crucial for the city. The Romans destroyed the city, but Julius Caesar ordered a Roman colony to be built in 44 uh, BC. He was never able to accomplish it himself but it was uh, Augustus that you see here in the museum, um, uh, framed by his uh, grandsons, Gaius and Lucius Caesar, being photographed by um, our photographer, Petros Villatolis, in, um, in the um, museum. And it was then Augustus who built the colony. The colony allows Julia uh, Corinthiensis, a city inhabited by a hybrid population of Greeks and Romans. The statues that you see here were excavated in the Julian Basilica. You see here the photograph of discovery of Gaius Caesar and the drawing by the excavator uh, Emerson Swift in the finds inventory book. The city, the, um, the building which this originated is the famous Julian Basilica, probably the seat of imperial cult, a building that demarcated the east side of the forum, of the Roman Forum. You see here a reconstruction uh, of the building in a recent publication in the series of the Corinth volumes by Paul Scotton. Fountains. Oh, before I go there, I just want to show you um, the plan of the forum, the plan of the center of the city uh, with the location of the Julian Basilica. And next to it, you see the Pirini Fountain, one of the famous, the most famous, actually, fountain in the city. Fountains, as you can imagine, were numerous because the city and, the, and its inhabitants needed a lot of water. This is Pirini our famous um, fountain that has been published in uh, this excellent book by Betsy Robinson uh, of Vanderbilt University. And you see uh, here the engineering feat of the tunnels, the underground tunnels that the Corinthians dug in order to, um, to get the water to the fountain. Um, you see here the fountain is 
uh, with its enclosed court is here. And next, I just want to briefly mention main, major roads, like the road that you see here, um, Lethion Road, the um, um, linking the city to the harbor, and obviously interconnectivity connection of the city to its landscape is crucial uh, for the major role the city played in trade. The wealth of the city brought the arts, and I show here a theater and the Odeon uh, for musical performances, a restoration of the um, facade of the stage building as it was uh, in the time of Hadrian, the second century AD, um, is here shown by Mary Sturgeon. Uh, along the east side of the theater, Roman buildings of the first and the second century AD were elaborately decorated with wall paintings, and you see a small fragment here, and the group um, of conservators that we have now in Corinth working on putting together these wall paintings headed by Roberto Nardi. This is the group of the Centro um, di Conservazione Archeologica da Roma. The fragments amount to 120,000 and were very meticulously excavated by uh, Mr. Williams's um, uh, team, uh, headed by the um, then conservator of the American school in Corinth, Stella Buzaki. Aphrodite of his many that you see here on the right is the protecting goddess of the city. And we have her in many representations in addition to the wall paintings um, in um, bezel rings, in terracotta, in marble, and lamps. The function of the buildings in this area is now under investigation in the area to the east of the theater uh, by Charles Williams. And we see here a restoration um, of the wall paintings. A Roman city would not exist without an amphitheater for gladiatorial games. Um, so you see here a picture of the amphitheater, but then also sanctuaries, uh, such, as, such as the sanctuary of Demeter and Quarry, have produced marvelous assemblages of um, finds. You see Demeter here on the right, um, and a number of uh, terracotta votives on the left in the shape of trays containing seeds and imitations of breads and cakes. The site was excavated by Ron Stroud and Nancy Bukidis, and now under uh, the direction of Nancy, a large uh, number of scholars are studying the statues, the terracotta figurines, the glass, the iron finds, in order to put together all of the activities that were happening on site. Um, our current excavations under the direction of Professor Chris Pfaff take place to the northeast of the theater. This is an area that was never previously investigated, but is very important as it extends between major monuments such as the theater to the south and the gymnasium to the north. And here is a view of our current excavations that happen every year between April and June. Uh, and we have a number of uh, graduate students from American universities who come and excavate with us and learn the practice of excavation and post-excavation processes in the museum. And just a few of the objects. Um, this is the head of um, Apollo that was excavated in 2022 and will appear in the forthcoming excavation report by Chris Pfaff and some of the uh, pottery assemblage. Uh, from these excavations. To move now to the second part of my talk, in order to present to you everything I just discussed, we do have to do a lot of work, archaeologists like me. And our objectives, all of us, all of us archaeologists who are part of the team of the American School Spill Project at Corinth, are to excavate, to organize and prioritize site and artifact conservation projects for study and display, to do collections research and organize the storage of artifacts. In that, we are very fortunate uh, to have workmen like Panos Kakouros who work in our Bukidis Buzaki building, the new building, organizing the storage of the artifacts. 
and then facilitate thus the production of academic publications, engage with the wider public in education and outreach, and participate in heritage management activities overall. So we excavate with the help of our workmen. We record our excavations in notebooks, or at least we did in the past. We now um, are doing this digitally thanks to the iDig app that was designed by Bruce Hartzler. We work closely with our conservators, and you see here our mending room with um, the assistant conservator Stefanos Spingos here. And here you see our head conservator, uh, Nicole Anastasatu, showing kids um, how conservation is extremely important both on site and in the museum. We research monuments and objects and publish their stories, how people made them and why. All of these activities are recorded and create a vast archive, both physical and now digital. And you see here our digital collections at scsa.net since 2007 when the digitization effort of this archive was initiated, co-founded by the European Union and the Greek state, a rich resource was added, including uh, over half a million records here. You see everything for Corinth. Um, we currently have a, a new digitization project that will start um, immediately. Uh, because we want to finish digitizing the remainder of our records and use uh, AI to create an app for digital exhibits. So other than images that you see here, digital resources include excavation notebooks, artifacts, coins, drawings, 3D models, video presentations. All of these resources are made available free of charge for teaching and research purposes. At the same time that we are creating this vast digital archive, we are supporting the official managers of the site, the Ministry of Culture and the local Ethereum, in their efforts to design the best possible solutions for the use of spaces in and around the antiquities. Corinth affects the life of many people. In 2017, we had visitors of over 160,000 a year, that is pre-COVID. It affects the lives, uh, Corinth is central to the lives of the local community, obviously. So we all need to collaborate. And the reason why we do our research is to create knowledge about how people dealt with life in the past and learn from them as we build our own futures. This knowledge must be disseminated to wider audiences. Thus, our outreach aims to bridge the gap between academics and the public. In Corinth, we teach the stories of people who lived in this landscape for more than 8,000 years, the stories of all the people. And we do that for many reasons. We have been trying to define who our community is, and we care about that community. The audiences we share our stories with are extremely diverse and challenging. And the question is why and how is Corinth relative and relevant to their lives? Our global reach is indicative. Our Steinmetz Family Foundation fellows, Katie Petroli between uh, 2014 and 2018, Eleni Gizas between 2019 and 2022, and now Taylor Twickler, who is our third Steinmetz Fellow. They all do our global outreach digitally through virtual field trips. And I just want to show you, share with you some numbers from Katie's um, um, time in Corinth between October 2017 and September 2018. Katie had, um, Katie led. 186 online programs. And these um, outreach sessions, these digital outreach sessions, reached 5,251 people in 40 countries, including Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Egypt, Georgia, India, Qatar, Spain, the United Kingdom, the USA, 
and Vietnam. These programs increase global awareness in participants. But as important is our local outreach. In the first place, we need to have our local community by our side. How can we communicate with the people who live on top of the monuments of ancient Corinth? Why should kids come to the museum? Because museums are occupied and given life by people. Museums are living beings. We think about our museum along the lines of Nikos Kazantzakis, the renowned Greek author of Zorba the Greek, who wrote in 1927, and I quote, books and teachers have taken our minds off track and ancient Greece has become in our imagination a series of lifeless marble statues. And when we go pilgrims to ancient ruins, we like to see them deserted and silent in romantic abandonment. But ancient Greece was full of voices and fights and merchants, and there were people and horses and pigs. There were colorful shacks and people were selling meats and chickpeas, toys and clay gods. Ancient Greece was not a supernatural flower without smell and without touch. It was a tree that had deep roots in the earth and ate mud and had blossomed. The purpose of our educational programs we do in ancient Corinth is following cousin Zakis to bring the past to life by teaching, by teaching about the people behind the objects. For the young generations especially, but for all visitors. Our essence is our common humanity today and in the past, and that is what we center our programs around. And I will give an example to explain what I mean. One of the things we teach is that of health and healing then and now, something that affects all of us. These life-size clay anatomical votives were dedicated to the god of healing, Asclepius, at his sanctuary in Corinth in the 5th century BC, either as thanks for treatments received or imploring the god to help the patient. The votives are passed around for the participants to touch in the sessions. So we populate the museum with the stories of the people again. The human essence, suffering and healing remains unchanged throughout time. To conclude, our research excites us. And if we communicate that to people, we have the power to affect their lives. We transform the museum from galleries of art objects and the archeological site from piles of rocks to spaces that contain personal stories, feelings and touches of the people of the past. We include the following. We invite the visitors active participation. We strive to engage and excite their imagination. We challenge them to give their own interpretations. We urge them to experience the objects and the spaces with all their senses. We explore a variety of themes, healing, music, women, trade. We talk about the people behind the objects. Uh, and I'm sorry that I missed, but yesterday all the staff in Corinth uh, created a fantastic International Archaeology Day celebration for everybody who was on site in ancient Corinth. Uh, because the museum belongs to everybody. So I have walked you through, as I imagine, Corinth's universal value for all people to be. Corinth is an archaeological landscape. So I believe that um, her universal value for all humanity may be viewed in two key features of Corinthian identity. First is technology, ideas, adventure, discovery, exploration. Corinth has always been a meeting point for people and for exchange of ideas, technological innovations, and experimentation. The site exists, second, as an inseparable part of the village all around it, and this coexistence with a modern day living community must make us all consider the values and needs of both. Our encounter with the past energizes our creative powers about who we are and where we are going. 
And I thank all the staff. I thank our director, Chris Faf, and my assistant, Manolis Papadakis, as well as the Athens director, Borna Westcott and Ioana Tamanaki for all of our teamwork in dealing with our many projects in um, Corinth. And I thank you all for listening today, and I would be very excited to hear your questions. So, Ilya, in the meantime, I thought I would ask a question as well. Um, how many how many archaeological sites in Greece have outreach programs? Can you talk a little bit about um, sort of the uniqueness of Corinth in this way? I'm not. I'm not aware. I know that uh, almost now all archaeological sites do on-site outreach. So have programs um, uh, at the actual sites. The, I think the uniqueness of our program may be the digital outreach that we do, which, as you are very well aware, is crucial in terms of the global reach. Um, of what we do, which is something um, anyway that exists in Corinth exactly because of the, the bulk of tourists and in Greece in general, I would say, from all over the world uh, who come to the site. So I think it is very important for, uh, for us, it is unique um, to do, to continue doing all, all the, virtual, the virtual field trips uh, that you started. Um, and this way we have a lot um, of interaction with people that would never otherwise have um, experienced um, Corinth. We also have started a new collaboration um, uh, bringing uh, people um, from uh, students from areas uh, in the US that would have um, difficulty um, or have the ability, wouldn't have the ability to travel so far because it is a very huge uh, trip. So, I think we're very fortunate that Steinmetz, is, the Steinmetz Family Foundation is supporting us and we use um, this uh, rich collection because um, what we also have that is unique is this very active uh, a group of researchers who um, are constantly producing new research and new information that then uh, we're very fortunate to share with people either come or online. Now, there is a second Steinmetz Fellow, um, and I think the first, this will be in Athens at the Agora excavations. Uh, so we are the pioneers, but now the Agora is following uh, us. <laughs> Io Victoratu uh, will be uh, sharing materials from the Agora and also uh, from uh, projects, exhibits that will be taking place in the Makrigianis Wing in, um, in Athens. Um, so, uh, I guess we are the ones who did it first, but more and more people will follow suit uh, because it is very important. And I know that the Ministry of Culture has a very rich um, educational outreach program. Our next question is, what led you to become an archaeologist? Yeah, this, this was actually an exciting question that I discussed with a number of kids um, uh, in the Parthenon yesterday. And for me, it was a great thrill to be standing in front of the gold gilded statue of Athena Parthenos uh, and talking to kids so far away uh, from, uh, from Greece, but so much interested. Um, I would, I think um, the most exciting thing were the, um, the images, the objects that people created in the past and their fantastic imagination and the way um, they um, used the landscape and their lives and they portrayed um, all of their feelings in um, their paintings, in their pottery. Uh, so it was this wealth of an imagination and my desire to know uh, how people in the past lived and dealt with um, with their lives. Um, and so that, I thought that was a very exciting. And also archaeology is a great puzzle of many sciences um, since it deals with all aspects of life. So I had inspiring teachers also back in Siatista in the Western Macedonia <laughs> because always the human, the human uh, person and um, fantastic professors both in Athens and in Cincinnati. 
Uh, our next question is, did Corinth serve as a gateway between Western and Eastern civilizations? I would say very much so. Because of our location, um, I believe this happened early on uh, in the period that I study in the late Bronze Age. So this would be um, uh, the 13th century BC, so millennia, uh, over three millennia ago, um, because we do know that pottery that was produced on the island of Aegina, which is in the Saronic Gulf in the east, is found in sites in Italy. So for this pottery to be going west, it would have to be traveling across um, over the Isthmus and across the Corinthian Gulf um, and all the way to the west. So this is one example. We also have um, a fantastic uh, sphendonoid hematite white uh, that I discovered in the collections. And this comes from modern day Syria, from the area there. So this shows that a merchant from that area and uh, similar whites appear in the Ulubrun shipwreck. So we have one uh, one of them, so a merchant from Ugarit, from modern day Syria, would have been in Corinth. And this is all the way in the, in the Bronze Age. And this continues very much because um, at the highlight of the pottery production, the orientalizing period, some of the, of the objects I showed you, a lot of the influences come from the East. Um, and then the connection of um, Corinth throughout time with Italy and Spain is constant. Um, so people, I believe uh, that people traveled um, across the Mediterranean uh, regularly. And you can't get any more luxurious than fish fillets from the Peloponnesian War era, right? <laughs> <That's incredible. laughs> yes, coming from the Atlantic. So <laughs> people were, uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. How could I forget the fish scales <laughs> yeah. that Mr. Williams excavated in the 1970s and then the uh, archaeologists are colleagues in, in Spain, like Antonio Saez Romero excavated the kilns um, in uh, San Fernando outside of Cadiz, where um, we know now um, the uh, amphoras were produced because we also have done uh, research by um, Leandro Fanducci on the fabrics of the amphora. So we know production areas like in Malaga and Cadiz for different um, amphoras full of fish coming from the Atlantic, yeah. Yeah. Um, our next question is, thank you so much for visiting us and offering this webinar. I would like to know if you have, if you ever use historians in your excavation or are the students only archeology span majors? No, we love historians. We, we actually have, yes, <laughs> I mean, we always love archaeologists. Don't uh, don't take me wrong there, but we need uh, historians because they give us a different perspective on things. And um, people knowing the literary sources are a wealth uh, for us. Um, uh, one of my uh, best friends and co-excavator Ben Millis uh, was is a historian. Uh, he went on and producing fantastic articles about the hybrid population. Uh, of Corinth uh, during the early Roman period. And uh, he was one of uh, uh, my co-excavators uh, when I was a student in Corinth. A number of the students are uh, historians or epigraphists. Uh, we have fantastic inscriptions. Uh, so definitely we need historians on site. All right, here's our next question. I would like to ask, what is the connection between ancient C Corinth and the quarry land in Ex Amelia. And you might need to share what that is for the folks who are not near ancient Corinth. And are the archeologists having any interest for this part of Corinthia? Thank you a lot for this amazing and useful speech. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, the quarries are very important. And uh, I focused in on, on the site of Corinth. Obviously, Corinth belongs to the wider landscape of the Corinthia and uh, the resources of the area, especially the stone, uh, were extremely valued in antiquity. And we do need 
um, to uh, learn a lot. Examilia is a very important uh, site, and there's been research done on the uh, quarries uh, by Chris Hayward, um, a number of people, and there's more uh, recent, uh, recent work as well. Um, because uh, the area of East Mia, Eastern Corinthia has been explored uh, by surface survey by groups of people and um, a lot of other projects are happening in the area. So yes, definitely, because we need to know, um, uh, and we have a number of quarries uh, also on site in, in Corinth itself, but we need to know where the stone, the resources, the stone was coming from because the Corinthians were trading um, their stone porous because it was such a useful uh, building material throughout um, to Delphi, to Apodorus. So, yes, it's very important for us to know about Ex Amelia. Our next question is, what advice would you give to students that want to become archaeologists? Advice to students about archaeology, follow your passion <laughs> because archaeology uh, is a very passionate field. We um, it may be difficult. There are a lot of difficulties nowadays in finding a job eventually. This is one of the major concerns for all of us. Uh, but um, we do need to continue our research uh, and we need archaeologists. Just, uh, um, I would say, um, prepare yourself, um, uh, study in depth um, the, um, the area that you're interested in. Um, and uh, come um, uh, do volunteer work, internships for us. Um, and um, yeah, follow your passion. Be passionate about archaeology. Our next question is, do you ever wish that the Temple of Apollo was better conserved or preserved? This is a difficult one especially being here now and seeing uh, the Parthenon, seeing the, uh, the three-dimensionality, uh, experiencing how the ancient space would have been, how people would have felt inside uh, the monument. The replica here is wonderful. It's a fantastic teaching tool about what, what the um, ancient monument, what the Parthenon would have... Uh, um, it would have felt like to the people who used it. But I don't know about the Temple of Apollo. I do not know that we have the material to restore the building in its original state. Uh, the material that it was used from, even though the porous stone was so valuable in antiquity and so widely traded, is uh, very difficult from what I hear from uh, our conservator, Nicole and Mr. Sadu, to work and restore um, and also, um, we cannot select, I guess, the period in time to prioritize over the rest of the times that the monument was used by, by people. All the destructions are part of the history of the monument that we need to respect. And it shows how the monument lived with people throughout time. And that's why its state shows all of this history. It, remembers in its stones all of its history. So I like the temple as it is. I would have, I wish I experienced it as it was, but I, I also love the way it is now. <laughs> we have a comment here from um, a viewer who was very fortunate to visit Corinth last April with the Examined Life, and they recommend oh. the site to anyone traveling to Greece. And they said it's one of the most interesting and spectacular ancient sites in Europe. So I would agree, but I know I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I really, um, I love talking to the examined life people um, and they're always a great source. Uh, and I wish we could have some of them come volunteer for us, but it is getting um, really um, busy in Corinth now, especially with um, the new digitization project that we will have. We will have a number of catalogers uh, working for us, so space might be tight um, for coming going forward. <laughs> it's a busy place, that's for sure, with many yeah. students and scholars from all over the world um, working, not to mention visiting. Um, it looks like we have a final question. Um, who would who says, thank you very much, Ilya, for such a wonderful lecture. 
Um, I would like to ask you, Leah, what are the challenges in managing such a complicated multi-period site like Corinth with a very long history? Yes, <laughs> this is the, the pinnacle of questions. <laughs> I think the only way to do, to do this project, to manage such a site, is with, te with a team. It takes a lot of people, a lot of us, and we are very fortunate in having this dedicated team um, of staff working in Corinth, uh, we, uh, we all work very well together um, and because uh, we, we do need um, uh, to, to keep our collections in working order, know all the time where the objects are to retrieve them. So we always go back to Panos Kakuros asking where are the objects when we have the, our, uh, the number of our researchers um uh, asking so we are we need to constantly be able to retrieve the objects for the people to study and uh, we've had up to 100 visitors 100 researchers a year using the collections so um, i would say that the um, the foundation of our research is our storage um, and proper conservation conservation is a huge issue um, uh, also, uh, different materials that both Nicole and Stephanos have to work on. Um, I mean, producing constantly new material uh, from the exhibition and added, adding to that collection. Um, but it's also extremely, the challenge is, is uh, so exciting because um, you have so many scholars who come through um, and always finding new materials. Like um, Sonia Klinger was in, uh, in Corinth before I left. and. Uh, uh, with Nicole, they figured out that we have bobbins from the sanctuary. This is something that Sonia is working on right now. So it's also, it's a great challenge, but it's also um, um, so exciting having um, such an alive uh, research center. Um, and we all figure um, problems together with Manolis Popadakis, with Chris, everybody working together. Yeah. And I know the the objects alone, you know, span millennia. You have prehistoric all the way through early modern. And the site itself, you know, some sites in Greece are almost single or a few periods, but Corinth has prehistoric all the way through medieval, like, you know, Absolutely. there's Roman, there's Byzantine, there's Frankish. So when you visit Corinth, you're not just visiting it at one point in time. There's all these kind of histories together, which which makes it challenging, but also means that there's something for everyone um, at Corinth because there are uh, so uh, many years and and people whose lives are told there. Ab ab absolutely, but this is archaeology. You can't isolate. This is why the place was so important. People loved living there, and we learn about all periods. You can't say only I want to focus on this period. It's about <laughs> everything. And we have, really a, like yes, we have a final question here that says, Dear Yulia, tell us about the great mosaics at Corinth. Oh, <laughs> I can't say very much because, I mean, the, this, uh, this question is about, is, uh, should be answered by Betsy Robinson. And I hope that Betsy, uh, Betsy I mean, that's a project that Betsy Robinson is going to be working on. Uh, to produce another fabulous book. Uh, so yes, we have fantastic mosaics. Um, it, it is really um, fascinating um, to, 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 to read about their, their stories. I mean, the Agonote Tune mosaic uh, with Betsy's publication at uh, AJA and what it represents, and also the great challenge of conserving and putting back um, in the South Store is something that we are working on in um, uh, the within the parameters of the project um, of um, the South Store right now. And, and then there's a, so many other mosaics. So this is a book. This is I yeah. cannot answer this question. We need to we need the specialists to address it. <laughs> well, and the Agonothetian one was project was happening when I was there, and it's a very mm -hmm. large mosaic. 
that is connected to ancient athletic games, which many people just think about Olympia, but there were others. And so Corinth also has connections to ancient athletic games. And yes, there's no, mosaics on display in the museum um, mm -hmm. and really all over the site. So if you if you like mosaics, uh, Corinth is a great place to visit. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, and all of this now is going to be also part of the master plan that we are uh, working on, which is something that uh, the uh, Ministry of Culture and the Effort of Antiquities is uh, spearheading, and we are all um, participating because it's something that the, the school started early on, um, and now we are working with a great, um, with a great and very dedicated team um, towards finding new solutions to age-old prob problems, uh, especially as um, the multitude of tourists increases, how the, the site should be better managed for more people to visit um, and enjoy the site, but also the visitors, but also us locals there to um, experience the site um, at its best. Well, thank you, Yulia, for your wonderful talk today. Thank you to all our listeners who joined us this morning to hear from Dr. Yulia Zonu. Thank you to Humanities Tennessee, to the Archaeological Institute of America, Nashville Society, to Centennial Park Conservancy, Metro Nashville Parks and Recreation. Without all of those folks helping us out this program and bringing Dr. Yulia Zonu from uh, one the Temple of Apollo in Corinth to a museum that is a Temple of Athena uh, replica here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it would not be possible. So thank you once again to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Yulia Zonu. Um, so if you are the in the Parthenon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you're um, in Greece, have a wonderful evening. If you're joining us from the U.S., have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you're the first to know about all the exciting things happening at the Nashville Parthenon.